design rules are always changing. One year, we're told to write code, and the next, focus on craft. But instead of resigning ourselves to just one or the other, the two of us have embraced the ambiguity, finding new ways to connect code with craft. I'm Katie. And I'm Lucas. And the two of us are system designers at GitHub. Together, we worked on many projects for Primer, GitHub's design system. We brought those projects from ideation all the way to implementation, and even shipped them to production. Some of those projects include design token infrastructure, color palette enhancements, and contrast and visual regression testing. And we did most of this without dedicated engineering support. Today, we want to discuss two prominent characteristics of designers at GitHub, end-to-end -end ownership and proactive experimentation. We believe that those characteristics help connect code with craft. They bridge the gap between what we design and how it later on works in the real world. To begin with, Katie will show you how taking your project from design all the way to implementation amplifies both its reach and its impact. For me, owning the end-to-end -end experience doesn't end with design. It's about taking responsibility and understanding the impact of your decisions. Playing an active role during development helps validate those decisions and makes you a better designer. Last year, Lucas and I completed a total refactor of Primer's design token system called Primer Primitives. Primitives is one of the oldest Primer libraries, and today it powers all of our components through CSS variables. And given that it's one of the oldest libraries, our color token names began to diverge over time and were different between Figma, CSS utility classes, variables, and JavaScript. For design tokens, the name is everything. If the name is different depending on the context, communication becomes very challenging. We knew the key to this refactor would be to create a single naming convention that could be used across all surface areas. Like any other design project, the first step is to establish a baseline and audit the existing system. We had a sense of how these colors should be used, but we needed a more realistic view. And for me, reading production CSS files is the best way to perform that kind of audit. I found that certain color tokens seem to be associated with specific CSS properties, like color accent emphasis was often used for border colors. However, that intention wasn't very clear from the name. You really would have had to read documentation to understand that rule. So we began to fixate on the CSS property and decided that was the missing link in our naming convention. From there, I compiled all of our existing color tokens into a spreadsheet, which essentially became our first data model. Each row had a legacy color token associated with a CSS property showing exactly how that color is used in both design and code. And by creating this kind of data model, I was able to ground our project in reality, planning for exactly what we needed and nothing more. And when we finalized our new token names, every single legacy color had a replacement value. We had a clear picture of how this new system would be used in reality. And this is where we landed and have since been maintaining for a bit. The property value is required, and it could be followed by something like a variant or a scale. And in this new model, color accent emphasis becomes border color accent emphasis. This decision early on to base the new system off of the old meant that we can then use that data to automate the rollout process. This is why keeping the end-to-end -end experience in mind from the beginning leads to better decisions. But beyond making better decisions, it also leads to better outcomes. By taking responsibility, you don't just hand off the work, you shape how it's implemented, handle edge cases, and make sure design decisions hold up in real-world scenarios. Since we had that original data model in the form of a spreadsheet, I was able to then take that and format it into a production-ready JSON file. In this JSON file, each legacy color had an array of new color tokens based on CSS properties. 
Oftentimes, a legacy color would actually have multiple replacement values, so having a JSON file to validate this was really critical. In this specific example, if the CSS property is border or box shadow, the border color variable will be used as a replacement. Data models are helpful for validation and automation, and I'll share how I used ours to automate the rollout process in just a minute. So we've established this is mainly a large-scale renaming exercise, and the colors themselves will mostly be staying the same. And while this change is technically customer-facing, it's not one that we want customers to notice. That means that we have to test everything, and testing in production is the best way to go for this kind of thing. Designers shipping huge sweeping changes to production? I don't know, what could go wrong here? At GitHub, we use feature flags to restrict changes to internal users. They can be flipped on and off with the switch of a button, and it's a tried and true method for testing things in production. So for my test, I loaded up my new design tokens if the flag was set to true. And by using fallback values in CSS, I could maintain all of our old code while testing out the new system. This means I had to add new color variables with fallback values to every single color declaration across GitHub.com. But I didn't do this all by hand. Primer uses a tool called Stylint, which allows us to define custom rules for authoring CSS. We already had a ton of rules in place, so I just hooked into one of those with my new data model. I then ran the Stylint script on .com code, updating CSS files with all of the new colors. And by having this kind of tooling in place, I was able to prevent tech debt from accumulating as new code gets added to GitHub every single day. With my changes in place, I opened hundreds of PRs, ensuring the new tokens were safely shipped behind my feature flag. By seeing this work through to production, I was able to gain trust with feature teams and not add a bunch of additional work to their backlogs. And when we were ready to fully ship the new color system, including documentation and Figma support, the development work had been done. We had alignment between design and code from the very beginning. Had I just handed this work off to engineering, I would have missed important edge cases along the way. It's those edge cases that helped inform the naming convention to begin with. By staying close to the implementation, I was able to design a system that worked just as well in practice as it did in theory. So, you might be wondering, how did a bunch of designers get permission to do all this engineering work? I'll hand it off to Lucas now to talk about his experience being proactive and experimenting with code as a designer. Many designers wait for an official project before even starting to explore a new idea. Maybe you do that too. But this severely limits your potential to innovate. In our fast-paced environment, it is important to take the initiative when it presents itself. Otherwise, you may miss all your opportunities. The problem with asking and waiting for a project first is that it can get really hard to convince your manager of the impact of your idea if all you have is a simple Word document or a static Figma file. In fact, you normally need to explore the problem space and create something like a proof of concept just to land an idea with your manager, which may later turn into a project. So to get your project, you really need to stop waiting for permission now and start exploring. The next time you have an idea, just follow it. Experiment a bit and see where this leads you. If this means you have to learn how to code, just do it. You don't have to become an expert at coding. It's enough to learn a little bit so that you can prove your idea. I know this may feel overwhelming now. We all have demanding workloads even without pushing outside of our comfort zone. I have done this before, and I'm not going to lie. It is hard, and it can be scary at times. But it is worth it. I truly believe that proactively exploring outside your day-to-day -day is the only way of building something new and something exciting. So let me tell you about a time where I explored outside my day-to-day. 
when Figma launched a new feature called Code Connect. Code Connect allows you to connect your Figma components to your React components. And when I learned about this, I was instantly in love with this idea. But I did have some concerns. Would this bring value to us as a company? Would it work with the complex components we built at GitHub? And would I be able to get engineering resources to set up Code Connect for me? However, instead of focusing on those worries, I went straight to the docs to see if maybe I could set up Code Connect myself. Whenever I do something like this, whenever I start something new, something outside my comfort zone, I try to start as small as possible, because if I fail, at least this way, I haven't wasted a lot of time. For Code Connect, this meant finding the smallest component I could, which was branch name. It has two variants. It's basically a text on a background. And with this component, I went through the five steps of setting up Code Connect, which is installing the NPM package, creating a config file, then getting a Figma personal access token, and for the component, setting up the Code Connect file and publishing it to Figma. So I began by installing the Figma slash Code Connect NPM package into our Primer React repository. My recommendation is that you co-locate your Code Connect files with your React files, because that just makes it so much easier to keep everything in sync. Next up, I created the figma.config.json file in the root of this same repository. And since I basically copied all the content from the docs, I'm not going to go into detail here. Lastly, for the initial setup, I had to create a Figma personal access token. And it's really important here that you set the Code Connect scope to write, because it's required to publish your files to Figma later on. And with this, it was time to create my first Code Connect component. And I did this by running the Figma Connect Create command in the root of the primary React repository. As an argument, I provided the URL to the branch name component in Figma. To get this, you just select the component, right-click it, and from the context menu, choose Copy Link to this component. Because I'm running this in the root of the repository here, I also added the out here flag, which allows you to specify the directory in which the new file should be created, source slash branch name in my case. And this created the branch name .figma.tsx file for me. And when I looked at this file, I was pretty happy with what I saw. It has the correct React component imported and used in the example. The link I gave us is still present, connecting my code connect with my Figma. And it even went into Figma and grabbed the type property and placed this in my code connect file. So what better to do, I figured, than to just publish and see what happens. So I ran Figma connect publish, and this is where I actually needed this personal access token. And then I waited. And while I waited, I got really excited. Would this work? Would I see my first Code Connect component in Figma in a moment, or would this fail? Sorry. <laughs> um, would I run into errors? Or even worse, would I run into a dead end, and I'd have to scrap the entire project? So when I opened up Figma, and I saw this purple box in the side, but I was overjoyed. This meant success. I had successfully published my first Code Connect component to Figma. But I quickly noticed that something was missing. My type property wasn't showing up, and it also didn't pick up the branch name that I typed into the component. So I went back to the docs to see if I could fix this. And what I found was the text content method, which allows you to grab the text of a specific layer in Figma. And with this, I created a new property called label and placed this in the argument part of the example function and also between the opening and closing text of the component. I went on to the type property, and it got a little bit more complicated, because this property works different in React and in Figma. In Figma, I want designers to be able to choose between the branch name being a link or a text component. However, the React component is a link by default. If you want to turn it into text, you need to add an S span property. Not wanting to change the user experience for either the designer or the developer, I actually figured out that I can change the mapping in Code Connect, which is what you see here. So now if a designer selects text, I map this to the correct React value of span. And if they select link, I can map this to undefined, which if you know React, if you give an undefined value to a property, it removes the entire property. When I published those changes to Figma, I was happy to see that everything worked. This whole process took me maybe 30 minutes, and I consider this to be a comparatively small investment, considering that I got an end-to-end -end 
proof of concept out of it. I went from just an idea to something tangible, something that I could show to my manager to explain the user experience of a developer going into Figma, trying to code up a design and how they can click on any component and get ready to copy and paste React code out of it. I could show this Code Connect file to a developer to help them understand how they could set up Code Connect for their own components. And best of all, I did all this with just the examples and the documentation that Figma provided. There was no advanced coding knowledge required here. And I find this to be very common, that with a lot of tools, if you have a basic understanding of JavaScript, you can get really far with the examples. So I would like to encourage you that next time when you end the situation, just give it a try and see how far you can get. But I wasn't quite done yet. I still had to figure out if this would work with our more complex components. And for this, I chose text input. Text input in Figma has 60 variants, and on top of this, four Boolean and five instance of properties. And the React component is even more complex. My first step was to actually open up the React file, and I started reading the code, trying to understand it. And while I didn't understand every last bit of it, I'm a designer, not a developer after all, I did realize that it was implemented very different in React and in Figma. As a result, I went back into my Figma and started aligning my design component to my code. For example, I extracted the validation message into its own subcomponent, just like we do in React, and nested this back into text input. While this is not strictly necessary, I do find it to be good practice. Of course, it does make it a lot easier to implement Code Connect, but in many cases, it also avoids property combinations in Figma that you cannot re replicate it in code. And for many components, I noticed this makes my components easier for me to maintain and also for designers to use. So it's a win-win for everybody. When I was done aligning this component, there was still a lot There was difference. But this is OK, because Code Connect is built with those differences in mind. So I went ahead and created my text input Code Connect file. And this time, it took me quite a while to get it done. It was very complex with a lot of variants, as you have seen. I had to refer to the docs all the time to figure out specific problems. And I published in between versions to Figma just to see what was and wasn't working. But most importantly, I kept tinkering at this 15, maybe 20 minutes every day. And then one day, when I published my latest version, I was finally done. Everything worked, and I got perfect code for every variant. And I carried on with this energy, adding more and more components, so that by now, I got to nearly 100% Code Connect coverage in our Primer design library. To me, this has been a great success, because I didn't have to wait for permission or for engineering resources to get this done. So what can we learn from my experience here? The most important takeaway is that with just a couple minutes invested every day, you can really drive your idea forward. It's this continuous effort that makes the difference. And if you do this, and if you don't turn your idea into a big project, you don't even need to ask for permission. Because a few minutes that you invest every day won't have an impact on your normal daily output. Lastly, working on something like this, on something outside your day to day, not only helps you learn new skills and drive new ideas forward, but it also has a significant impact on improving your existing, your core skills. Just like how in working on Code Connect helped me improve the way that I build components in Figma. Today, we shared how designers at GitHub test the limits of traditional design roles by connecting code with craft. We hope we inspired you to look for opportunities to uh, step outside your comfort zone and own the end-to-end -end experience. Design roles will always be changing. So take advantage of what you can control and stay curious. Thank you so much. Thank you.